stay a while and listen. In July 1874, Nietzsche attended a meeting for the heads of the various departments at Basel University. The issue the ten men discussed was whether or not women should be allowed to enter the university. After two hours of discussion, the vote was six to four against women being allowed to enter the university, with Nietzsche on the losing side. Nietzsche had voted for women to be allowed into Basel University. In the book Human or to Human, he published a few years later, in 1878, he made favorable remarks on women, saying that the perfect woman is a higher type than the perfect man, and that women can through education acquire all the male strengths and virtues. From these and other remarks, we can see that Nietzsche in this period thinks women are just as intelligent as men, respects them, and is sympathetic to the women's project of emancipation. We may even call Nietzsche in this period of his life a feminist, or at least an admirer of feminists. Yet in the next decade, in 1886, in Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche has completely changed his views about women. In his greatest philosophical work, he suddenly launches a vehement attack upon women and the feminists striving for emancipation. He says that women has much reason for shame, that a woman scholar has something wrong with her sexuality, and that the proper role for women is bearing and bringing up children. He furthermore claims that women has no concern for truth, that their great talent is in the practice of lying. These views are so comical and absurd for us to read today, and we are only left wondering how they could come about, especially when Nietzsche the previous decade had been praising women and their cause of emancipation. So how can we explain Nietzsche's turn from a feminist who supports women's emancipation to a misogynist who showers women with hostile abuse? To answer this question, we will turn to the events in Nietzsche's life between these two completely opposite statements. In 1882, Nietzsche met a girl called Lou Salome, and the events surrounding her would leave him bitter and spiteful. It is in this affair of Salome that we will search for the cause of Nietzsche's turn to a vehement misogynistic view of women. On the 26th of April 1882, by an invitation from his best friend Paul Rhee, who had arranged the match, Nietzsche, aged 37, met Salome for the first time. He greeted her with a rather cheesy line of what stars have brought us together, and instantly fell in love with her. Salome was 21 years, clever and beautiful, and pretty much every man she met wanted to sleep with her. The problem was that Paul Rhee had also fallen in love with her, and over the next few months, a sort of dramatic love triangle would play out between the three. The three also made plans to live together platonically, that is, without any sex, in a sort of monastery of free-thinking individuals. In May the next month, Nietzsche offered Salome his hand in marriage, but she turned it down. Later she would say, in a fight with Nietzsche's sister Elizabeth, that she could sleep in the same room with Nietzsche without getting the least bit excited. Louis Salome was not interested in ending up in a submissive married role, and even told the men she met that her love life was closed for the duration of her life. Yet Nietzsche and Rhee still persevered in gaining her affection, which ended with Paul Rhee leaving with Salome later that year. This was basically an abandonment of Nietzsche, and he was devastated. Furthermore, during this affair, Nietzsche's sister Elisabeth had spent time with Nietzsche and Salome, acting as a sort of chaperone to make sure their conduct was proper. She severely disliked Salome, and reported to their mother Nietzsche's plan for living together as three with Salome and Re. This so scandalized Nietzsche's mother that she said to Nietzsche that he was a disgrace to his father's grave, whereupon he walked out of the house, slamming the door behind him. So just in the space of six months in 1882, Nietzsche had lost his best friend, his love, his sister, and his mother. That year he spent a miserable and lonely winter sending letters to Paul Rhee and Salome. The letters were mostly angry, and he even went as far as calling Salome a dried-up dirty monkey with bad breath and false breasts, and also calling her a slut. This anger towards Salome then seems to have extended to all women, 
since in a notebook entry later that year, he was abusive of women in general. I have shown Nietzsche's transformation from a feminist to a misogynist, and a biographical explanation based on his life has been offered. Yet one should not reject Nietzsche's other philosophical remarks and condemn his person because of these statements. He does at least give us a disclaimer before his vehement remarks on women and beyond good and evil. Here he says that, on offering truths on women, one needs to understand that to a great extent it is only his own personal truths. He here thus admits a suspicion that a sort of personal pathology or sickness has entered his own philosophy. He may thus have in mind that he has not recovered from the Salome affair and are thus very prejudiced in his remarks and still full of bitterness. It is also interesting that despite these remarks, Nietzsche and his writings have attracted a great many feminists. They were drawn and still are drawn to his personal message of liberation and self-realization, which is much like their own message of liberation. Yet how do feminists deal with these misogynistic remarks, these hostile remarks on women that we can find in Nietzsche's works? One strategy was to argue that it was superficial to see Nietzsche as an anti-feminist. That approach does not work, however, since Nietzsche insisted in letters that his remarks should not be understood as anything but anti-feminism, that he was in fact a big bad wolf to feminists. A second and more reasonable approach is to treat Nietzsche's anti-feminist statements as a personal weakness in Nietzsche. One feminist friend of Nietzsche said that the statement had not made her indignant, since a man of Nietzsche's breath and vision and sureness of instinct has the right to get things wrong in one instance. Nietzsche's prophet Zarathustra exhorts his disciples to leave him, to guard against him, and even be ashamed of him. He wants them not to remain pupils, but to think for themselves. By putting in these wild remarks about women, one could argue that Nietzsche has done his students who read him a sort of favor. When reading Nietzsche, it is very easy to be spellbound and fascinated with what he's saying and how he's saying it. But when one comes upon his sayings of women, one is forced to regard him very critically and to see him as merely a human being. These remarks on women can thus function as a sort of warnings to his readers to not follow him blindly, to not set him up as a god or idol, but to actually look at his life critically and look at the life that produced these writings.